Hey everybody, Ron Carruthers here. Uh, I am here to chat with you guys about five reasons your 529 college savings plans most likely suck and you want to get rid of them. But before we get to what to do about them, let's talk about why these are a problem. First of all, if you don't know me, I work in all areas of college, finance, and retirement. That's my specialty. And I work hard to be, for lack of a better word, I try to be the most knowledgeable person that our clients know when it comes to all areas of personal finance. College happens to be the specialty, but we help our clients with retirement, all those other things. So let's chat about the college system. First of all, for those of you who may or may not be aware, there is actually a 529 day every year. It's May 29th and everybody writes a bunch of articles talking about how great the 529s are. And I'm like the one grumpy old man telling everybody, ah, they suck, get rid of them. And um, funny enough, I didn't even think of this at the time. This May 29th will be my uh, ninth anniversary. I actually got married on May 29th. <laughs> oh, man, if y'all don't think I take college stuff seriously, now you know that I do. But um, anyway, here's what they are. If you're not familiar, they are a tax-advantaged way to save for college. So you do not get a tax break when you put the money into one of these bad boys in the first place. But what you do get is tax-free growth and tax-free withdrawals, kind of like a Roth IRA or 7702 plan. The catch is the money can only be used for college. So you might be thinking, well, that sounds like a pretty good deal. Why do you not like these plans? And I will give you the five reasons that I have concerns about them. The first is they can be counted against you in the formula up to 25% of the actual cost of going to college per year. Now, when I teach classes live every year, I get somebody to raise their hand and be like, well, I read an article in the New York Times that says that they can only be counted as a parent's asset at 5.65%, which by the way is the maximum that a parent's asset can be counted at in the formula. And so the question that I always ask him is, that's great, but according to whom? And they're like, well, what do you mean? I mean, who says that? Whose rules say that? I'm like, well, I don't know, I just read the article on my thing though. There's your problem. Because what happens is, there is both an art and a science to planning for college. And by the way, we're recording right now an online college class that will walk you through the basics A to Z. So if you've never been to one of my workshops and a friend flipped you one of these, just look for an announcement on my page here. And um, we'll, um, we'll get that up in the next day or so. I'm actually sitting down to record it right after I do this. But um, anyway... So in the formula, there's two different types of formulas. There's the public school formula and the federal formula that they give to the public schools. And then there's the private school formula, which the private schools look at and use for their own money, which is in often cases, the majority of the money. Even schools like UCLA, Berkeley, those guys use a slightly different formula for the money they give out of their own pocket versus money that they give that the state or the federal government gives. So this money, this 529 money, can be treated as a resource against you. And when that happens, that resource gets used against you. You can lose even though you were doing, quote unquote, the right thing and planning ahead. And that's what we try to get you to avoid. That's the number one reason why we're against these. Now, in certain cases, they won't hurt you at all. You don't have a lot of money in them or um, you are going to schools where they will not use a secondary formula. It won't hurt you in the state of California, for instance, on a Cal grant if you're under a certain limit. But by and large, if you're saving for a, a younger child or younger children, you're better off not having one of these so it doesn't get counted against you. By the way, in case you were wondering, there are 13 million of these accounts and a little over $300 billion in these. The average family has about 24,000 in one of these accounts. So there's your biggest problem. They, the people that sell these 
don't understand how the actual high college formula works, and therefore you get punished for that. So that's problem number one. The second problem is, is the fees on a 529 plan tend to be significantly higher than a normal mutual fund. Why is that? Well, a couple of reasons. Number one is, is because often the state that sponsors them gets a piece of the action. So one of the big complaints about an investment vehicle that we're not big fans of, my dog says hi, she got to come to the office today. Hey, knock it off. We're working here. Come here. You want to say hi to everybody? This is Star. You guys got to see the chickens. You might as well get to see the dog. Star. Come here. You got to say hi to everybody. All right. This is Star. She only gets to come to the office once a week. She's a rescue dog. She's normally a pretty good dog. Uh, in summer, you guys will get to see. She'll get shaved like a lion. It'll be awesome, but it's too cold for that now. All right, no more barking. Anyway, the problem is with one investment vehicle called a variable annuity that people rightly complain against. There's very seldom usages for a variable annuity, which is basically a mutual fund wrapped in an insurance shell. So you're paying both the insurance company and the mutual fund company, and it ends up being a very expensive way to do business. 529s are similar in that their fees, for the most part, are considerably higher. In fact, CNBC, I'll read this headline to you. They ran the headline a few months ago, commissions are devouring your 529 gains. Now, their solution was to select no and low, no and low load funds but again, that's one of the bigger problems is the state's got their hand out too, and there is no such thing as a no-load mutual fund. Just wipe that out of your brain. It does not exist. When you have companies like Vanguard and Fidelity, which there's nothing wrong with those guys, but when they're taking out um, full-page ads in Money Magazine and US Today Today at hundreds of thousands of dollars a pop, somebody's paying for that, and it's not them. It's you. There are fees in there. They just happen to be lower. So what was step number one? Remember, the one reason I hate it, it counts against you. The second reason is the fees are substantially higher. Now, here's the third problem. This is a biggie that most people don't think about. The biggie is that when you withdraw money from a 529 account, you are operating on a completely, completely different time frame than you would on a retirement account. So let me give an example. If you retire at 65 and you're male, the odds are that you're gonna to live to 86 years old. Then if you're female, these days the odds are 88 years old. Those numbers actually came up the last few years and then actually came back down. And the reason for that was suicides and opioid deaths um, actually brought the overall life expectancy down. That's just how bad a problem opioids are. Fentanyl, things like that. But anyway, when you go to withdraw money, you're withdrawing that money over a 20, 25 year time frame in some cases. So the fluctuations day by day don't hurt you as much as they do on a 529 where you've got money in the market, but then you're taking this risk and if the market drops like it did in 2000 or 2008, the problem is, is that now your money is going to turn around and it might not be back to break even when your kid's getting ready to go to school. Let me give you a perfect example of that. If you had, let's say, $100,000 in a 529 account, in an April or uh, in October of 2008, and your kid was getting ready to go the following 2008, I mean, uh, the following year to college. If you had $100,000 in a Vanguard Index 500 mutual fund, that fund would have dropped in value to less than $50,000 by the time next fall rolled around. So now the question is what? Are you going to tell your kid they can't go? Are you just going to withdraw the money and take a loss on it because that's what it's there for? Are you going to wait until the money rebounds and now your kid turns around and maybe they've graduated college. Guess what? Remember, you only get the tax break if it's specifically used for higher education. So that's the biggest flaw of all, if you're asking me. So the time frame is so short that if there's any hiccups in the market, 
By the way, that same Vanguard Index 500 mutual fund did not get back to break even until March of 2013, five and a half years later. So your kid would have come and gone from college in that time frame, and that was very real. We had clients in 2008 that were moving these where it made sense so they wouldn't get penalized in the formula. In fact, one of our families um, that I'm thinking of in particular had set the 529, no star. She doesn't get to come for the next video if that's the end of that. Um, anyway, she had turned around and put 50,000 in 529 over 10 years earlier. And when we went to withdraw this money so she wouldn't get penalized in the formula, she turned around and only had $48,500. She'd actually lost money over a 10 year time frame in this account. Now that doesn't mean all 529s are gonna do this. This just happened to be a very specific set of circumstances. We actually had to go look and call the IRS to figure out where do we get to take the loss because they had never addressed that before. 10 years later, it hadn't made any money because the market came up and came down. And so the problem is, for a lot of people that were getting ready to retire, then they had the option of working longer. In this case, she did not have the option of telling her kid, listen, you hang out for five years while we turn around and wait for this to come back. Instead, we got rid of it, got it out of the formula, got this girl 38 some odd thousand to go to um, Santa Clara University many times over, that was per year. So she ended up getting over 120,000 to go to a private school that this 529 would have hurt her on had, had we left it in their name. So now the other thing I get told on that is, okay, well, I'll just be real conservative and put it in an account that can't lose money. Well, hold on a second. The only benefit to this is if you make money, then that gain you don't have to pay taxes on. So if we go too conservative, you have the higher fees, which are gonna eat into your profits. You have the fact that it likely, if you go to private school, possibly state school will count against you at a bigger rate than they're telling you. And now it's not even making money, so you're not even getting the tax break. There's your problem. I gotta look at my notes now. Um, Here's the fourth problem. If you don't use it all and you save too much, remember now you pay taxes on it. You pay tax on your gain and penalty just like an IRA. And you cannot roll it over to a retirement vehicle, nor can you put the money back. Now you go, what do you mean put the money back? Well, an alternative that we use in a lot of cases is a 7702 plan. And on this 7702 plan, it doesn't count against you in the formula. The fees are a little stiff the first couple of years. They back off after that. Um, it can't lose money in the market. And you can use whatever's left over for retirement. So a much better alternative in our opinion. So that's kind of your fourth flaw is that if you do too good of a job and with other planning, we get you money or you get money on your own. Now you may have money left over that now you have to pay tax and penalty at whatever rate they say. And so that's actually your fifth rule as well, which is you can't use it as retirement. So what should you do if you have one of these? That's the big question I get, okay, I've got one. Well, let's walk through this. The first thing is, you have to, we have to research two pieces of information. The first is, what would you be expected to pay per year for college if you didn't have the 529 and what will you be expected to pay having the 529? So if you make several hundred thousand dollars a year and you're just clearly not going to get financial aid, um, at least not need-based aid, then don't worry about it, leave it alone. But many people assume that they won't get need-based aid who will qualify and the 529 may be the only thing that gets in the way on that. So if that's the case, then we need to look at the second piece of information, which is how much gain did you really have on this 529? Because getting rid of it could end up giving you a bigger problem, a big tax problem. And again, the goal, remember, why do I keep emphasizing that we try to be the smartest people you know when it comes to all areas of college planning, 
personal finance and retirement because we don't want to solve a college program problem but at the same time create a tax problem so you've got to balance those out but let me tell you a little story about a client of ours up the silicon valley area so guy's name is dan Dan is an executive for a big company, Fortune 100 company that you would absolutely know by name. Um, he is paid $150,000 a year. He has some rental property. He has some other assets, married a woman, um, not the mother of his kid. His, his wife actually passed away. And um, she had assets from her husband who passed away. And we got their expected family contribution down to around the $45,000 mark. Now you're like, $45,000, that's what you've got it down to. And if you're not familiar with that term, expected family contribution simply means what can they estimate that you can pay for one year of your kid going to college, any college. And that formula, that number can be controlled by planning ahead. Now in this guy's case, with no planning, it would have been 90, I think it was 90,000. Well, if you take that number and subtract it from any school in the country, even the most expensive school, which I'm researching right now for the webinar I'm going to do in a couple minutes here, that is Harvey Mudd at $76,000 a year. If they feel you can pay $90,000 a year, they're not giving you any financial aid to get a Harvey Mudd. But now, if the number comes down to $45,000, we subtract the $45,000 from $76,000, eh, he's got about $30,000 of financial aid not too shabby so that he may get doesn't mean he will there's a whole process and again if you're not familiar with this you got to watch my video coming out I'll make sure to put it on this page the link to it so you guys can check that out if you haven't seen it anyway back to my man's story so we got his EFC down to $45,000 a year but he still had $80,000 in a 529 that he had made some money on so here was my comment to him, look man, if we get rid of this 529, you're going to pay some taxes on it. And you're not going to like paying those taxes. But your top two schools are $60,000 a year schools. That means we actually have about $15,000 a year of need-based aid that you could be eligible for. And both these schools are known for being generous. <coughs> now, it doesn't mean they give you the entire thing for free. What it does mean is those schools will give you some money. So let's do some math here. And we anticipated that the one school, Northeastern, should have given them about $7,500 a year free. And the other one, George Washington, should have given them about $9,000 a year free. So that's what we were looking at. If he cashed out the 529, he would have to pay about 6,000 in taxes. So here's what my comment to my client was. Look, there's, I can't guarantee that you're gonna get money here. But if we go through and get rid of this money, on $80,000, you probably made about $30,000, and that's why you're going to pay $6,000 in taxes. Now, he should have paid more than that, but we were going to wait until the year the kid actually went to school so that we could use some of that money for his first semester in school, and then the rest he'd pay tax on. By the way, that's a pro-level tip there. You can get rid of a 529 early in the year that your kid is actually going to college, and whatever portion they don't help them with actually is tax-free, just the rest isn't. They're, they don't require that there's a direct line between the money in the 529 and the school. And in other words, they match it up on a tax form at the end of the year so you can theoretically cash in a 529 in January, go to Vegas with the money, gamble all the money away, and then turn around and make the kid borrow the money in September. I'm not advocating this, by the way. Make the kid borrow the money in September and still get the right off for the 529 money because money got spent on the school and money was taken out of a 529 in that same calendar year. So anyway, he was going to end up paying about $6,000 in taxes. So what I told him is, look, excuse me, if you're a betting man, 
this is the way I would go play this. Number one is, I'll get rid of this. And here's why. It was a few years ago, but the market had been going up almost straight up for several years at that point. He made $30,000. So I'm like, you put in 50, you have 80. We should really lock in this money, not be greedy. Remember what was the third reason of 529 stocks is if the money drops in value, it doesn't have time to recover. So we can end up losing a 10% drop. We'd lose 8,000 versus a twenty uh, a $6,000 tax bill that's not bad, and the opportunity to get free money over here. So I'm like, you gotta make the decision, but I feel really good, like I'm giving you good advice. I tell you to get rid of it. If it was me, I'd get rid of it. So here's what happened. He got rid of the money in January. We parked it somewhere that it was exempt. We left some money out to pay for the first semester of school. Northeastern would not give this family anything. Remember, 7,500 is about what I anticipated they would not give him one red cent nothing but and we begged and pleaded and whined and did all kinds of stuff george washington remember they were supposed to give him nine thousand dollars they gave him seventeen thousand five hundred dollars a year now stop and think about that seventeen thousand five hundred dollars times four $70,000. It was, you can think of this two ways. It was one year of tuition fees, room board, totally, and then some in his plane tickets, or it was two years of tuition free. A little bit of planning. And I promise you, he would not have gotten any of that money had they left the 529 alone, because the feeling would have been based on the formula. Dad can afford 45000 dad and stepmom. And you've got this 529 plan that's 80000 which cut into fit force is 20000 a year, $65,000, you can afford the whole thing. So that's why we encourage you. If you have a 529 plan, don't go out today and get rid of it. That would be malpractice on my part to tell you that. Step one, find out at the schools you're thinking of going to, are you eligible in any way, shape, or form for A? And how much damage is that 529 going to do? Step two is how much tax are you going to pay for getting rid of it? And then step three, I'd argue the market's been really volatile lately. Does it make sense to maybe lock in some of those profits, particularly if you've had it a few years, so that you don't suffer and get hit? So what are your five problems again? Number one, they count against you in the formula at many schools, despite what some of the talking heads and CFPs and CPAs that don't understand this say. Number two is the fees are higher than a normal investment. Number three is they can be, um, if there's any sort of losses, it can really hurt you. Number four is you can't, you can overfund these and end up paying tax and penalty. And number five is you can't use it for retirement like you can a Roth IRA or a 7702 plan, and on a 7702 plan, you can put essentially within parameters an, uh, an unlimited amount of money. So that's your tip for the day. Um, by the way, this was exceedingly um, appropriate because today is February 5th, 2019. We got a five, we got a two, and we got a nine in that number. So there you go. And this will save me from having to record this video on my anniversary, and if you guys are thinking, uh, you want to buy me an anniversary gift, us an anniversary gift, we'll take uh, red wine, white wine, Irish whiskey, anything like that. Hope you learned from this. Share the love. Hope you guys enjoyed the video as much as I did making it. I'll try to keep my dog out of the next one, although you have to agree she's beautiful. And um, we will be back and do it again. Please be sure to hit like on this. If you have any questions, anything else you want to see, hit them in the comments. And um Please feel free to pass this video along to your friends, and I'll have that webinar information after you guys in the next couple days. See you soon.